Hey yo, the Tony Ox Pro Skater Series is not only the best skating game of all time, but one of the best games of all time. Alright, now let's play that title card. It's 1999, a skateboarding, punk rock, and alternative rock music were on top of the world, hitting ridiculous mainstream levels of success. Tony Hawk had become the first skater to land the most legendary trick of all time, the 900. Blink-182 released Enema of the State, selling over 15 million copies worldwide. And of course, some of the most triumphant cinematic films of our generation came out that year, and that was American Pie and Johnny Tsunami. It was awesome. <laughs> One minute you were just a kid playing Pokemon Gold or Silver on your way to school, and then the next minute you're begging your mom to buy you dicky shorts at Hot Topic, while this guy at the cash register tells you, Here's your change. Idiot. With the skateboarding video game stars aligning, skateboarding games were bound to explode onto the scene, most notably with games like Top Skater and the arcades already brewing. Activision approached the company Neversoft with their impressive resume of exactly one game, Apocalypse starring Bruce Willis? That sounds awesome! To make a skateboarding game. They eventually showed an early build of the game to Tony Hawk, and Tony Hawk was all like, Damn, that shit looks pretty good! And I'm Tony fucking Hawk. Not bad. Activision signed a deal with them, and bam, you got yourself a Tony Hawk's Pro Skater game. Now, someone play me that ska music. Oh yeah. Now that's what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. This is happening. This game was a massive hit, released on the PlayStation One in 1999, selling three million copies in 2000, and eventually getting ported to other consoles like the N64, the Dreamcast, and everyone's favorite cell phone, the Nokia N-Gage. N-Gage. This game series became, and still is, a massive phenomenon, spawning countless amounts of companies to turn their head and eventually make their own skating knockoff. We eventually had hilarious games like Disney Extreme. Only hardcore skaters remember that game. Reach for the sky! The Simpsons skateboarding, and that one horrible rocket power game. And the series had so many sequels that not only defined the 2000s culturally and aesthetically, as well as musically, but was so fun, innovative, and addicting on a fundamental and core level. Shit. It was f***ing bonkers. So what makes Tony Hawk's Pro Skater game some of the best skating games of all time, as well as one of my favorite game series of all time? Alright everyone, so pop quiz. So what makes gameplay that's supposed to mimic something you can do in real life feel good? Like when you play a sports game, are you playing it to see how realistic it feels? Like how much you can replicate the feeling of playing a sport in real life? Or do you want to play a sports game to go off the walls and do crazy fantasy-like stuff that you can't do in real life? I like to separate these sports games from simulation versus elevation. I'm gonna put it simply to you. Would you rather play Madden? or NFL Blitz, NBA 2K, or NBA Jam. And there's no right or wrong answer either. You're not any less of a real gamer girl if you prefer one or the other. But it's important to make that distinction in regards to making a game that's supposed to mimic something in real life. Neversoft had the difficult task of making a skating game to appeal not only to skaters, who wanted a more realistic interpretation of their sport, but fans of video games in general, who liked this. Shit, that's a chaos emerald. Hold it right there, yep. creep. So where does Tony Hawk's Pro Skater land? Is it just a skateboarding simulation, or is it an elevation of skateboarding? And the answer is neither. It's right smack dab, right across the middle. That dude's pretty good. Hey, yo, someone give me a PhD in Tony Hawk games, because I'm about to blow your f***ing mind. It both simulates what it's like to skateboard in real life, and elevates what you can't do in real life. That's awesome! Never saw deliberately design the physics and the level design to have more of an emphasis on fun first, then being realistic second, while also having a good mixture of both. Tony Hawk would literally visit their offices and send them videos of actual skaters doing tricks, just to make sure the tricks and the gameplay felt authentic to skateboarding. The physics in these games feel so spot on, and they always got better as the games went on. The gravity, the building of momentum, the timing of tricks, making sure to land them properly, while also feeling like a video game, but with the insane tricks and launching and flying like hundreds of feet in the air. Hey yo, check out that guy, he's about to do a McTwistle over a helicopter, bro, while he does a backflip into a nada spin? But besides crazy special moments like that, grinding on houses, breaking through windows, and grinding on telephone wires are all but normal in your skating playthrough. Can you imagine leaving your house to go to school and all of a sudden you see an insane kid grinding on the speed of light on your neighborhood telephone wires? 
Whether it's a school, the beach, across the United States, or countries around the world, hell, even outer f***ing space, every level offers a unique style and aesthetic. Coupled with the fact that every level, no matter where you are, is designed to string your combos and not stop the flow of gameplay. I gotta make my combo last. This makes the level design even more interesting because it doesn't necessarily have to be a skate park that you're in in order to skate. Almost everything is literally skatable. That's ridiculous, man! The level Moscow and Tony Ox Underground is a prime example of this. I mean, look at this guy getting a billion points as he's traversing through the level. I mean, just looking at it gives me a feeling of zen. The environment and level design allows him to do crazy tricks as he's, like, literally almost flying across the map. It's f***ing cool. It feels like I'm playing a freaking arcade game. It's so addicting stringing combos in so many different ways, and skating never felt so good while listening to your favorite music. Which leads me to my next topic. If it's one thing that the Tony Hawk games are iconic for, it's the amazing soundtracks that are included in them, and how the game's song selections have a direct link to skate punk, the culture behind it, and skateboarding history in the 90s. Punk and rap music and skateboarding are like bread and butter. They just work together, they go hand in hand. Why would you not have bread with butter? But the reason they work so well is because they're all subcultures that resist the mainstream culture, the establishment. And while the subcultures would eventually become the mainstream culture, the defining of the Tony Ox Pro Skater soundtracks and why the song selections are so important can be traced back all the way to the 1980s. Certain branches of punk bands have always been triple mick flipping and not a spinning in the Southern California skateboarding scene since the early 1980s. But the skate punk genre wouldn't really make a name for itself until Bad Religion released one of the most iconic punk albums, Suffer, in 1988. This particular album inspired an onslaught of radical melodic punk bands in the 90s, like No Effects, The Offspring, and Pennywise, which got featured in plenty of skating and surfing videos, which allowed them to gain more notoriety, and would define some of the most iconic tracks in the Tony Ox Pro Skater series. I'm a huge fan! Skateboarding music, however, isn't just exclusive to punk rock, as there's actually plenty of skating videos from the 90s that incorporated plenty of rap, thrash metal, hardcore, psychedelic rock, and even some jazz. That's awesome! Never saw knew if they accurately wanted to depict what skateboarding culture was like, they had to have a kick-ass soundtrack that incorporated and represented all types of music, not only defining skating music, but also defining the 2000s culture in music as time went on. As the years and the underground and alternative culture changes, the music to some capacity reflects that. Uh, what are you, some super fresh scratch master DJ all of a sudden? Yeah. It was great. I remember listening to this different kind of music that just really opened my mind, having just so much fun as the music only accentuated the feeling of skateboard. The games are notoriously responsible for getting kids like myself not only into punk music and the culture, but had great music selections from all types of bands and genres. Some of the biggest artists they had included acts like The Dead Kennedys, System of a Down, Atmosphere, The Clash, Iron Maiden, Less Than Jake, Rage Against the Machine, My Chemical Romance, f***ing Frank Sinatra had a song in there. You ain't a true skateboarder if you don't listen to Frank Sinatra. That's funny. Uh... I know I mentioned pretty popular bands and bands you've probably heard of, but the series is also known for giving exposure to plenty of obscure and underground bands and artists on eventually some of the biggest popular games of that era that normally couldn't get a spot if they didn't have the star power or financial backing, forever cemented in these soundtracks. And if that ain't some type of punk rock ethos, I don't know what is. Advertising has you chasing the American dream. Think for yourself. And lastly, we have the larger than life skating missions. As the games went on, the regular campaigns of finding skate letters, getting high scores, and finding the secret VHS tapes slowly was pushed to the side for the more intriguing story modes, and man were these missions crazy. It started off fine and well with Underground. It's basically about a broke skater trying to make a name for himself with different story twists and plot turns, getting into amateur skating competitions and trying to be a pro skateboarder, along with rebelling and being a skate hooligan. Better run from the pigs. Oh, that's real funny, smartass! Until Underground 2 released, and that pretty much changed the scope of the missions and what's even possible anymore. I mean, just just look at this. of these 
and the directions of these games really went balls to the wall. These missions only further highlighted how the game was trying to be just more than a sports simulation. This move was clearly inspired by the rise of MTV and Jackass, a cultural phenomenon that not only defined the 2000s, but definitely squeezed its way into skateboarding culture here and there with skaters like Bam Margera, for example. This went further into American Wasteland with a more comic book inspired aesthetic. Taking one look at the gameplay, the music, and the soundtracks, as well as the missions and story modes, each iteration always pushed the gameplay forward in some capacity that kept players wanting more. After Tony Hawk's American Wasteland came out, Tony Hawk's Project 8 released. While it definitely kept its self-aware and goofy tone, they really toned down the silliness as well as the whole destruction and jackass-esque type of humor. And then when Proving Ground came out, they decided to take a grittier, more serious aesthetic, probably from other skating games that came out in the era like Skate, for example. As well as the wackiness of the 2000s was shifting into the 2010s, which definitely took itself more seriously. And that was the last Tony Hawk's game Neversoft made after closing its studio down. And no, we're not talking about the f***ing Robomondo uh, games like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5 or those shitty motion games not made by Neversoft. What the hell is this plastic board I gotta step on? What happened to my controller? That is literally the antithesis of what makes Tony Hawk's Pro Skater good! What are we gonna make, a f***ing plastic football as a Madden game? Awesome! Killer Pete for the Rams! Neversoft's Tony Hawk games represented skating as well as 2000s culture like no other video game before or after it. To this day, the gameplay is super radically enjoyable thanks to its arcade-like approach. I would even go as far as to say that these games also inspired the underrated NBA Street games that were amazing for their time. And multiple pro skaters quote the games as being direct inspirations into getting into skating. And I think part of it has to do with how the gameplay allows you to creatively express yourself on how you want to skate, the same way skateboarding does in real life, or any kind of artistic expression for that matter. Instead of telling you how this game series might have inspired people and skaters alike, I'll let Tony Hawk the man himself tell you. For many, the games came at a formative time in their lives. They picked up skating, a lasting taste in music, and a sense that you don't have to follow a stuffy career path to be successful. Many people have told me that the game kickstarted their career in music, sports, or filmmaking because they saw that we, as pro skaters, had a different, more refreshing approach to life. And with that all being said, drop a comment down below, make sure to like, subscribe to Instantly Die, and I'll see you later. Thank you for watching. Click the subscribe button below to be notified on when Mudjora Threat releases a new video. Click the television on your screen to transport you to a similar video through the World Wide Web. Follow your dreams, protect Earth and question authority. Goodbye Internet Travelers.